Um, we were talking earlier about why collectively the sell side got Apple so wrong this year. Why do you think that was? Is it about uh, the model changing to services and sort of uh, the mystery of margins behind that, or is it something else? Well, I think the, the mystery behind the move to services has been uh, very well covered, and Apple seems to have successfully maneuvered from a company that made all of the cell phone industry's profits to one that is making profits outside of just the cell phone industry. And that took a lot. People expected it maybe that Apple would become the next BlackBerry or the next Nokia who once owned the market the way Apple does. Mike, the fact that, and I know we've had this conversation before, I think it's worth revisiting it again, this idea of Apple being an indicator for the broader market. It's not so much an indicator in the sense of um, economic bellwether status or something that's really telling you about other parts of the economy that also affect the market, but it absolutely uh, is sort of this marquee name when people want to buy the market, when there's momentum inherent in the growth stocks, Apple has tend to, tended to participate. The thing is, it just goes on these crazy streaks. So over the course of this year, it's traded at a 20 percent discount to the market in terms of its uh, price earnings ratio on a forward basis. And now it's at a 20 percent premium. So it's not as if the, it's telling you anything about the business itself necessarily. It's really about um, everything going right in terms of privileging these growth stocks, the market deciding that the profit pool that represented by Apple is, is going to be durable. But also, um, you know, it's reliable. It's buying back a ton of stock. Buffett's not selling any. It's almost got this scarcity premium embedded in it, too, which will last until it doesn't. I mean, honestly, it's momentum at this point. Now, Tim, I'd be curious for your perspective on tech stocks in general. We've seen such a huge run-up in tech stocks, but it sounds like you think we need to be thinking about tech stocks differently. They're not like tech stocks during the last bull run. These are more sort of like utilities. Explain your philosophy here. Well, I, th I think you, you hit the nail on the head in that uh, during the 2000 run-up in tech, and really that is 1996 through 2000, when technology was in its nation stages, you had web browsers getting huge premiums. America Online, I think, was the 10th the largest holding in the S&P 500 at the time. Um, and technology was really being used by businesses to make themselves more efficient and just beginning to scratch the surface into the consumer. Now it is part and parcel of everything we do. It's hard to look at an industry that doesn't use technology, cloud-based services, or devices to drive their business. So maybe technology is a staple now and, and not a sector that people need to worry about. Mike, do you agree? Do you think we're seeing a sea change in how tech is going to be treated moving forward? I think I, I do agree in the sense that just the stability of the revenue and profit pools, especially when we talk about the tech sector as uh, kind of this block of the market, I think it's important to actually know what you're talking about when you talk about the S&P tech sector. It's 40 percent Apple and Microsoft right now. Those two stocks, 40 percent. Another 10 percent right after them is Visa and MasterCard, which absolutely are basically software utilities. They're payment processors. So it's not as it used to be where it was kind of a boom bust, a lot of semiconductors kind of cycle driving the, the market. So it does seem to have taken on those characteristics. But still, what do you pay for a consumer staple? What do you pay for uh, a defensive growth stock? That becomes the question. The NASDAQ 100 now trades at 23 times forward earnings. It's the highest it's been in 10 years, but it's nowhere near what it was 20 years ago. Hey, Tim, 5G uh, continues to be uh, maybe a less understood story right now than it will be later, obviously. But I wonder, is it a consumer story or an enterprise story? Because we've heard both. Well, I think like any technology, it'll probably start as an enterprise story until you have enough devices, enough network, and enough software developers developing those cool next generation of apps that really benefit from 5G. 5G will use to make what we already do faster um, and maybe more ubiquitous um, and have a remarkable effect on the streaming services business, which is a whole other industry that wasn't really technology 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And to add to what Mike said, if you look at what made up the S&P 500 20 years ago, it was um, about, it was Procter & Gamble, it was Walmart. Now, if you look at the top 10, eight of them are technology stocks. You go to number five and it's Berkshire Hathaway at almost a third of the value of Apple. So it's hard to not see technology driving the market, whether it's up or down. Yeah, Mike, I mean, just to dig into this point a little bit more, it might not be FANG per se this year. Um, right. Certainly Netflix has kind of fallen off a, a little bit in terms of that dominance. but. NASDAQ Composite, another example. When you look at the fact that it's weighted by market capitalization, almost a third of the entire index is weighting is Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet, Class C shares. And then if you 
go a little further, it's also alphabet class A. I mean, how sustainable are these yeah. moves and how much of it is really just centered around these big cap tech companies? I think you could decide the market has it right that these are entrenched platforms that they're kind of in a very long term way going to be able to remain uh, that way and kind of grow faster than the overall economy. That's what the market's implicitly saying. But that doesn't mean that any price you pay is going to be re reasonable for it. And I think that's the argument we're having. It's not so much, are these great businesses? They're valued where they are because we know they're great businesses. So that's not the, the disagreement. The disagreement is, are we getting a little overexcited in the short term yeah. about them? Tim, a question for you about the tech losers, because looking just at some of these companies that have had really rough years in the tech sector, Juniper Networks down 9%, um, you know, Alliance Data Systems down 26%, DXC Technology down 29%. Are there some through points here for the losers, certain trends that you think might even continue for next year? Well, yeah, I think in the losers in technology space, you've had two areas. You've had the semiconductors, which have been in a boom-bust cycle really based on trade talk and trade rhetoric, um, although we are headed into a 5G world. And then you have those cloud services providers that aren't keeping up with, it, with Amazon or with, with Google or, or even with Apple uh, when it comes to consumer-based cloud services. So I think it's gone into a, a winners and losers, not necessarily any area of tech that you want to stay away from. So then in light of that, Tim, um, how much of this hinges on interest rates staying low? And is tech, are some of these tech names that we've just gone through uh, still the best places to be in the market more broadly? Well, I, I think maybe to make a broad generalization, interest rates matter for everything. And the yeah. market multiple that we're getting on, on the S&P 500 as a whole could also lead to higher, you know, P.E. ratios for particularly growth stocks. That being said, some of these companies are so cash rich that higher interest rates don't necessarily affect their ability to continue to develop and make money. But I think the whole market would get shaken if we had significantly higher rates.